call on John Fletcher with Fletcher Consulting, who is going to introduce our speakers for uh, our luncheon today. And again, thank you, John. Our speakers are going to, by the way, be uh, producing a video. And so uh, there will be a few crowd shots. So if you're in the Federal Witness Protection Program, just kind of duck down a little bit every now and then if you would when the camera comes by. Today we're going to learn about bringing positively outrageous service into our own companies from two guys who literally wrote the book about it. Hold on. I'm supposed to show this. <laughs> literally wrote it. So, Andrew Zabo, he's the guy with the funny accent. He's British. And he's also written The Foundations to Irresistible Marketing. It's the book that the legendary Zig Ziglar said was the whole shooting match for marketing. Andrew grew passionate about customer service when he moved to America and went to work with the Hyatt Hotel chain. And Michael Hoffman is a normal guy like us. He was made in America, and uh, although it was California, so not really sure. <laughs> but anyway, he and his wife have survived four teenagers and are now grandparents. His clients have ranged from Aflac to Dryer's Grand Ice Cream, so he is a pretty cool guy. Anyway, today they'll share about how positively outrageous service has redefined some of America's iconic brands and how we can implement it in our own businesses. I know I've used a lot of these tips over the years. Please welcome these two champions of customer service, Michael Hoffman and the crazy Brit, Andrew Zaba. Crazy Brit. Crazy Brit. I have to live with that. <laughs> You go on the right, I go on the left. There you go. Okay. Positively outrageous service. It's an amazing phenomena. And uh, it's not advancing. You advancing? Oh, there we go. So I want to tell you a story about some extraordinary virgins I met a few years ago. Uh, I was on my way to Love Field. And yes, that day I was that passenger. You know the one when you're walking through the concourse and uh, they're paging, uh, Mr. Zabo, please come to gate 11. We're about to uh, close the doors on uh, flight number 452 to Las Vegas. Uh, what happened was I was, I had actually two clients in Las Vegas that I was meeting with and I had a, a video that I was taking to one of them and it was running late. So I had my Uber lined up, I was TSA pre-checked, I was, everything was ready to go. I was just going to go all the way through, no check baggage. I was turning into Love Field, the phone rang. You know how it works, you don't recognize the number. What do you do? You hang up, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Pulled into the curb, same number. I hung up again, I'm in too much of a hurry. I'm now going through TSA and it rings again. This person really wants to get a hold of me. Oh, this is Brian with uh, Virgin America. Uh, are you here at the airport? Yes, I'm here at the airport. And TSA takes away my phone. They said, you've got to go through. Run to the gate. Gate 11. It's closed. Nobody there. I'm standing with my phone, looking down at the cockpit. I could see the cockpit. I could see the pilots. I mean, it's only 10 past 10, and the flight doesn't leave till 10.20. Why would they close the gates on me? Well, eventually, all of a sudden, the... Um, the gate opened, the door opened. Now, I never heard that they would open the door after it's been closed, and I'm pleading with this guy, and he said, oh yeah, my name's Brian. Oh, the guy I hang up on. Please, I've got to get on the plane, I've got a client on the plane, I'm meeting another one in Las Vegas, and uh, he closes the door. A minute later, the door opens again. You can get on the plane. Have you heard of anything that outrageous that they would open the door? I think they were breaking the rules. Yes, I'm were. getting on the plane, going down the jetway, and I'm greeted with these flight attendants. And they smile at me. And they say, Andrew, we are, Mr. Saba, we're so happy that you made the flight. We're delighted to have you with us today. My blood pressure went down. That is positively outrageous, isn't it? And that's one of, the, I have told that story countless times. And that's one of the attributes of positively outrageous service. It's a wow customer experience you can't wait to tell somebody else about. Actually, the thing that I like about that story, and I don't think anybody reacts to it, which is kind of interesting because, uh, you know, uh, we, he asked, I think that was breaking the, the rules. 
You know, you, you, you open the door and you let them actually get on the, the plane. And, and we all go, oh, that's so nice. That is so great. But uh, nobody reacted when he got a phone call. How many of you got a phone call from the airline going, hey, you're late. Where are you? We're concerned. That never happens. Right. I never get a phone call. So I don't know what crazy Brit thing you're doing, but I never get a phone call and then to be if I'm running late. Greeted on the plane yeah. with smiles yeah. after all that. Yeah. That's outrageous. How many, has anybody here had an experience where you would say it, it was above and beyond? You know, uh, you talk about HEB. You know, what sets all the organizations in this room apart? Uh, you're, and you're consumers. Has anybody ever had an experience where you said that was a wow experience above anything else? Is anybody in this room at all? Really? That, that, I mean, how, how many of you have ever had that maybe in the last 12 months where you would say this truly was something memorable as far as uh, maybe not necessarily a stopping a plane and opening a door, but one where you walked away going, this is why I shop here. Has anybody had one of those? Yeah. All right. Two. Look around the room. You don't have a lot of hands up. And I'll tell you why. It's because it doesn't happen that often anymore. Why is that? Is it because as consumers, as patients, you know, as participants, we kind of get numb to the idea of what a wow is? I mean, what is a wow? You know, if you think about it, there are things that separate you from anybody else that, that does anything similar to what you do. And it's not your products. It's not your pricing necessarily. It's not, it's not any of the tangible things. It's something that you've been celebrating every single time you all get together. We, we've already given away a couple of plaques today. Members, you know, uh, sponsors. And you know, and you know what it is? It'll always be about what? People. Business will always be about people. And when you think about positively outrageous service, we're talking about the business experience. Well, today's an opportunity for us to kind of get our heads around and to restart a revolution on the customer experience, and there's lots of reasons why uh, that we'd love to share with you today. So how powerful can positively outrageous service be? Well, there's actually whole industries that have radically transformed because they changed the service model. One, one, uh, item, uh, one company that comes to mind, iTunes. Who remembers you had to buy a whole album and you only wanted that one song, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. they cha iTunes changed radically the business. You can now buy a song for 99 cents. Yep. How outrageous is that? Blockbuster and Netflix is a classic story where um, uh, the, only, the, the big person who started Netflix started the idea because he didn't like paying late fees. It was returning a movie. Anybody remember Blockbuster just a little while ago? Oh, yeah, they made their money. Their model was on late fees. That's where they made 70% of their income was on late fees. And there was a young uh, gentleman, actually it wasn't a young gentleman, he was a very rich gentleman, who basically said, I don't, want, I don't want to pay $40 for Apollo 13. And so he came up with a new system. You know what's really, I find interesting about this is he tried to sell it to, to Blockbuster and they said, no, <laughs> you kids, we make our money this way. And uh, we know the rest of the story. Airbnb. I remember a few years ago, uh, Marriott proudly announced that we are bringing 20,000 rooms online in the next year. Airbnb said, we're doing that in the next two weeks. <laughs> Here we have one of the largest hotel companies that doesn't have a single hotel. Mm -hmm. yeah. Changing, out positively outrageous. Taxis and Ubers, I mean, uh, same thing, disruptors. Uh, the largest taxi service in America doesn't own a single taxi, not a single one. Hotels, taxis, everything is being disrupted. So how many of you use iTunes, Airbnb, uh, Netflix, Taking an Uber, Uber, Luba, uh, Uber, Luba. Yeah. <laughs> You're part of the revolution. You're part of the revolution. You have seen a better way to serve customers and you bought into it. And you, and you know what's interesting? It's not the app. It's not the technology. Right. They just came up with a better way to serve the customer. Mm -hmm. And that's what Positively Outrageous Service is about. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm Andrew Sabo. I'm Michael Hoffman. And we're here to share a few key principles with you today. First of all, what's the benefits of positively outrageous service? Why should we bend over backwards for our customers? Three reasons. You've already heard one of them. It creates that compelling, positive word of mouth. I have told that virgin story. Uh, hundreds of people have heard that. What's more powerful than somebody else talking about you? That's way more powerful than anything you could ever say about yourself. Mm -hmm. One of the most powerful things you can do in marketing, advocacy. The second thing is intense loyalty. Who doesn't want to have customers keep coming back because they want to have that incredible experience that they had with you? And the third thing is it differentiates you from the competition. So advocacy, loyalty, and differentiation. Anybody here want that for their business? 
Okay, then you're in the right place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'd like to share with you a couple of things today. If we got a short period of time, uh, we, we've got some things that we would like to kind of ignite you personally, not only just in your, in your jobs, but uh, in your departments, at your cubicles, and even at your home. So there's a, if we had 30 minutes with a group of people of influencers like yourself, uh, we want to share with you three principles that Positively Outrageous Service is built on. Three principles that you can take uh, and be a little selfish with. So we'd like to encourage you for the next couple of minutes just kind of ask yourself this question what about me you know what about us what about my department what about my company how do we do it because you might not be king or queen of everything but you do have influence within your life and the more we get people to really start to focus on the fact that business will always be about people our lives will always be about people your products will change uh, the systems and processes that you do will change everything will change because it's all about disruption but you're going to be on top because you know the foundation of it all is about how we do business with each other. And that, I think, needs more of a revolution now than ever before. Ever before. And so we'd like to take 30 minutes with a group of influence to say, what about you? How are you being positively outrageous? We want to introduce you to three principles. The first principle, it needs to be unexpected. Now, uh, as you heard uh, from John, I started my career with uh, Hyatt Hotels. I had the privilege of opening up the Park Hyatt Washington, uh, which is, uh, is on 24th and M Street. And on those four corners on an intersection, there were three hotels on that intersection. And there were a multitude of other hotels within a mile and a half, the Ritz-Carlton, the Four Seasons. We had tremendous competition. But we had an interesting ethos. We thought, how are we going to deliver positively outrageous? How are we going to differentiate ourselves from the other competitors? How are we going to... Uh, deliver something that's unexpected. So we had a simple policy. It was called never say no. We had to figure out how to not to say no to our guests. And if you were like a front desk clerk and you had to say no, then uh, you took it to your front office manager. And if the front office manager had to say no, he would then take it to the rooms exec. And if the rooms exec had to say, if it couldn't figure out a way to say yes, it went to the general manager. So you didn't usually get to the general manager because then we allowed everybody to be creative. So let me give you one uh, outrageous example of this. So uh, we were close to a lot of the embassies. So we, had a, we picked up a lot of embassy business. And uh, one day there was this uh, sheik and his whole entourage from one of the Arab embassies came in. They were going to stay there for about two weeks. And uh, in the main suite, uh, there, there was, in all the suites, we had a, a nice round dining room table. Well, he had a, quite an entourage, so he wanted a, a bigger table, right? So we said, could I have a bigger table? No problem. So actually, it was his aide. And we said, yes, we'll put in a bigger uh, table for, your, for, for, your, for dining. The trouble was the chandelier that was perfectly suspended in the center of the circular table was now at one end of this long table. I hate that. So really do hate the aide came down to the front desk. Is there any <laughs> way we could move the light to the middle of this long table? Well, sure. Uh, well, it went all the way along to the rooms exec. The rooms exec then went to the chief engineer and said, is there a way we could put the light? Well, we're going to have to go into the ceiling. And then after he leaves, we're going to have to come back. Well, how much is that going to cost? Uh, about $3,500. This is in uh, $1987. We went to the aide and said, yes, we can certainly move the, uh, the chandelier, and uh, it will cost $3,700 to move it and then move it back afterwards. No problem. Put it on the bill. Positively outrageous. As one Finding sheik ways to do. To say yes. <laughs> what? <laughs> Second principle. Random and unexpected. First of all, do me a favor. Turn to the person next to you, look them square in the face, and say, random and unexpected. Got to get your lips moving. When you get your lips moving, you're connecting your head, the brain, to the lips. So look across the table, if you will. Look across the table. You might even give them a little point and go, you are so random and unexpected. Just tell them. <laughs> you are so random and unexpected. And just, just to be nice, turn to the person next to you and just go, you smell delicious. You really do. Just <laughs> the person next to you. just Because they're concerned. We're always worried. Uh, okay. We're always worried about that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So number two, and I know we only got 30 minutes, so we try to we'll go through these real fast. Uh, so number uh, number two principle that uh, positively outrageous service we like to call POS is built on is is being out of proportion to the circumstances. And if you've ever, I know you've got stories like this, but you know when you travel a lot, you accumulate a lot of stories. And one of my favorites happened actually this year, quite recently. I'm flying into Atlanta, and I got to drive down an hour and a half to Columbus, Georgia, to work with Aflac, which is one of my favorite companies in the world. And 
and uh, that hour and a half. So I, I get off the plane, and if you're like me, you nest. So when you get on the plane, the first thing you do is you unload everything. And I call it nesting. So you, you, know, you get your laptop there, and you get your headphones, because you don't want to have to open up your bag afterwards. So you take out all your stuff, and you put it in there. I, I call it nesting. And I can tell a, 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 a seasoned traveler when they nest in front of me. I kind of go, oh, I know. you do this a lot. So I, I appreciate that. I nest. And uh, I, I, as the plane lands, I collect everything, and I take off down the road. I got my car I'm about 15 minutes down the road, 20 minutes down the road, 30 minutes down the road, and I get a call. I get a call, and it's Mary. And she says, hello, is this Mr. Hoffman? I said, yes, I am. She goes, hi, this is Mary with American Airlines. I said, hello, Mary. She goes, how are you doing? I go, I'm doing great. How are you doing, Mary? She's going, oh, my gosh, I'm having a fabulous day, but I got some bad news for you. What? She goes, I think I've got something of yours. What? She goes, yeah. I go, what is it, Mary? She goes, I can't tell you. I said, Mary, this is a horrible, horrible game. <laughs> and she goes, yeah, yeah, but I can't tell you. Did you leave something? And I went, I don't think so. And I started going through the mental thing. Zzz, and I said, oh my gosh. Mary, did I, leave my, did I leave my computer? My life, my business, my presentation. <laughs> Mary, I left my computer. She goes, yeah, yeah, you left your, present, you, you, you left, left your computer. We've got it here for you. I go, oh my gosh, I'm 30 minutes down the road. She goes, well, um, I'll tell you what. Uh, well that, and that was very nice anyway. I got a call. I appreciated that. But she goes, I'll tell you what. Why don't you meet me up front? Give me a little text when you get a little bit close, when you're about to pull into the airport. I'll meet you out front, and, uh, and, I'll, and I'll get your, your, you don't even have to stop. Don't even park. Don't, don't spend any of that money. Just, just come up front, we'll get it to you. I'm like, oh, Mary, you'd do that for me? She goes, yeah, I would do that for you, Mr. Hoffman. I really would. I go, well, thanks, Mary. And I pull up front, and sure enough, she, brought, she comes out, she brings the computer right to my door, I roll down the window, and, uh, and, and gives me my computer. I, you know, I, I travel quite a bit. But I will tell you, you know, there's a reason why I will spend more money, and I've got options, you know. I've got options to spend my money anywhere. But out of proportion to the circumstances, she could have just said, Mr. Hoffman, it's a courtesy call. We got your computer. We know it's important. Just, it's just waiting for you in the lost and found. But instead, after a few seconds of talking with me, she decided, I'm going to go with the extra mile. And out of proportion to the circumstances, she actually left her desk, picked it up, walked it all the way up to the top, because, you know, they live in the dungeons down there. And, and met me up front in my car, didn't have to park, didn't pay for parking. That was outrageous. And I've talked about it a lot, and probably will for a long, long time. So right. number two, out of proportion to the circumstances. Turn to the person next to you and say, you gotta be out of proportion. Yeah. yeah. Look across the table to the person across you and just go, you are out of proportion. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I saw what you had for I lunch, you crazy people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, so there's clearly a lot of people who are random and unexpected in the room and out of proportion. Yeah. The third principle is invite them to play, and we're going to have a game with you. Yeah, actually, uh, I want you to open up your observation skills and really pay attention. This is one of uh, my fortes. We've done this exercise around the world, and in any, in any culture, it's the exact same thing. And if you just paid attention to what's about to happen and really understood what's about to happen, you will literally be able to put your hands on anything that, that you do will be successful, I promise you, because we're going to show you the secrets of success in business, and it comes to being positively outrageous. So um, do me a favor, open up your observation skills, stand from your chairs. Stand from your chairs, if you will, boldly and strongly. Look at you guys. Oh, no. <laughs> What's he going to make? They're one of those. Oh, no. All right. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to really open up your observation skills and pay attention. And I know I'm going to assume you've already got the people at your table. But I want you to find five people in this room, and I want you to acknowledge them. OK? Five people, go. I didn't turn on the clock. I know. Sorry. I mean, I, oh, I did. I did stop. I get, uh, one second. I mean, Any idea? 12.45. Oh, we've done, done it. One? Um, we have 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, freeze! Stop. Right where you're at, Stop. freeze! Freeze, freeze, freeze! Now, some of you are not at five. I saw some people over here, you're like, at seven. You're like, geez, that's, that's incredible. So, I, I know you didn't get five, that's okay. I'm gonna mix it up a bit. I want you to find five more people, except this time I want you to do it differently. This time I want you to do it as if you're at a family reunion and you haven't, you haven't seen each other for 10 years. Go, go! Oh. What's that? I don't know what happened by clicker, but... I, it's fun, kind of trying to keep up with you. <laughs> Hi! Nobody left. Okay, have a seat, you wild animals. Have a seat. Sit, 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 sit. 
All right, everybody sit. That was weird. <laughs> sit, 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 sit. That was weird, wasn't it weird? Okay, just for time and brevity, somebody give me some observations. What'd you observe? What's the difference between the first interaction and the second interaction? Yeah, there was hugs. There was a few hugs in round one, but man, they went up in volume. There was a lot of huggage. And by the way, don't go blaming that on us. We never told you to hug. Yeah. So don't go telling people, oh, you guys are the hug guys. No, no, <laughs> you're the hug people. We never said hug. But there was huggage in round two. That's interesting observation. What else? The energy. What about the energy? Did you observe? Yes. Yes. So I we had the, energy in round roof one. Actually, went up a few inches. Yeah, it did. The energy was in round one. I appreciated you choosing to play, yeah. but it definitely went up in round two. Yes, ma'am. You didn't say your name the second time around. Why? Because you were family. Yes. Familiarity. You know what I love about that question is why didn't you? Why weren't we family in round one? I never. I never said oh. don't be family. But isn't that interesting? I, I really want you to get your heads around this. There was a difference between round one and round two. And, and we would expand this out in a, in a larger version. But uh, in, in round one, essentially, I'll get, cut to the chase. What happened was I put you in a situation where you had to make a choice. And that's what this word is all about, play. You had to be in a position that where you said, am, am I going to choose to play? Am I going to choose to participate? And you didn't have to. We're just large men with microphones. I'm a large man with a microphone. <laughs> You're the good-looking Brit, always. Gosh dang it. <laughs> so yeah, so I'm a large man with a microphone, and all I said was stand from your chairs. And here's what happened. You had to take the vision that was given you, and you had to say, am I going to do this or not? Am I going to play or not? And there was lots of reasons why you did. Could have been peer pressure. But for some reason, you said, I'm going to play. And you stood from your chairs. You made a choice to play. I really want you to get your heads around that. Because a lot of times we think that we're the victims of how we approach our customers, our patients, our, the people that we do business with, the people that we work with, when in reality you are always in control of the choices that you make. So you chose to play. And then we threw out uh, an instruction, meet five people. It always, it makes me, I'm always interested, why don't people start in round two? The energy was higher, there was less bubbles. You know, I don't know who made the choice first, but you, somebody made the choice. Because here's what happened, round two was added vision. Leadership said, let's do it differently. Let's create vision. Let's, let's treat each other like family. And the masses said, how do we do that? And you interpreted it through your filter, through all the things that make you you, from all your history, from your family, because I promise you, there's a hundred people in this room, not everybody thought that was a good thing. Some of you are going, family, are you sure? Really? <laughs> yeah. So you had to interpret it, and, and we said, go. And somebody did it. I don't know who started it because we didn't tell you to do it, but somebody made a strong choice. And we said, treat each other like family, go. And you all went, ah! like that. Woo! That's a strong choice. Now keep this in mind because you, your choice, and I want you to get this, your choice to play made somebody else make a choice. Because they're looking at you like, oh, dear Lord. Um. And guess what? It became, what the heck? <laughs> infectious, didn't it? Yeah, and it wildfire. Because people next to you are going, we could do that, I didn't know we could do that. Because ah! round one was very nice, you all made choices to play. Round two was different. And it's not about the huggage, because if we never hugged, it'd be okay. But the energy was much higher. The smiles were bigger. The interaction was definite. Can you imagine if all of the people that do business with you felt like round two? You know, that, 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 that's not a mistake. We have to create that. That's what, that's what POS is all about. It, we're not the victims of our business. We create our business by making strong choices. And this, this little word, inviting customers to be involved, inviting customers to play, I spend my money very purposefully most of the time. And if I'm going to come to do business with you, I want to feel like I'm a part of what's going on as opposed to a victim of what's going on. Very, very powerful. Round two is created. And, then, and I guess to kind of cap it off is what choices are you making these days? Because lots of people are working with you. It's not just your customers, you know, or your patients or the people that do business with you. It's also the folks that work right next to you. I mean, how many of you work with that one person that has retired, but their body keeps coming into work every day? <laughs> how many of you, that might be you. I am here to tell you, we are here to tell you, it might be you. Make stronger choices.
Turn to the person next to you, look them square in the face and go, I'm so glad you played. Tell them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Turn, look across the table, last one, look across the table and just say, you know what, let's be infectious. Go ahead, tell them. <laughs> Here's my challenge to you. If you are not playing enough at work, then you be the one to go first. Because I think just like in this room, what it, what it proves is, and what's proven over and over across the country internationally, is people want to have a good time. I, wanna be, I, wanna, I want there to be joy when I work with you. I want there to be joy. Have you ever had that person that you work with that, that when they show up, it gets better? I, I hope that's you. It's not your pheromones. <laughs> it's the choices that you make when you walk into a room. It's not the scent that you give off. Let's, let's choose to play. So in summary, What's the first principle? It's up Definitely on the board. unexpected. Read it. Second principle? <laughs> and the third? Play. Yeah, because yeah. play creates engagement, and engagement gets people involved, doesn't it? Mm. Now, now they have a vested interest mm. in uh, participating in positively outrageous service. Mm -hmm. All right. This is actually kind of fun. When yours doesn't work, I feel very, very powerful yeah, very right powerful, now. Powerful, I do feel very powerful right now. Do, I can make it's like dance monkey like, boy. Here we go. What are you gonna, <laughs> that's actually kind of, that's kind of fun. <laughs> so actually, this takes, uh, takes a culture. It can't be just a program. Mm -hmm. It can't be just a, a one-off event. You have to create a culture of positively outrageous service. So Michael, tell us about the Bank of Montreal. That's yeah, you know, um, the, the principles are things that we can do on purpose. But, you know, it takes a culture that fosters these things that really makes a momentum uh, for an organization large or small. And that's why you have, to, you have to have both. It's not just shining people that, boy, I'm so glad I, I hired you. I wish I had 100 of you. It's actually you create a culture that fosters this with everybody. Because very few people of us wake up and go, today I'm going to suck. You know, uh, and I'm bringing everybody down. It's very few. They do exist, and maybe they work with you, but very few. But Most of us want to be yeah, part minority. of something. <laughs> Classic example, a, a great client of ours, a, a Bank of Montreal. I worked with them for seven years, and they were at the bottom of the barrel with customer experience. The top five banks in the country, they were number five, and they had a goal with a brand new visionary who was taken over as president. We're going to be number one in five years. What do we have to do? And they did it. And they, and they started with their people. And they, and they created a culture by, by changing language, by getting the leaders involved, by having everybody understand what their role was, that we are all part of this. We're not the victim of this. We're the, we're, we are the creators of this. And through very, very specific actions, they went from number five to number one in a very, very short period of time, knocking on the door within five years. Within seven, they were, they were top dog. Um, but that's, they're not the only one. We have these kind of... This Examples book was originally written, as uh, you heard, by T. Scott Gross <clears throat> 28 years ago. 28 years ago, there was a little regional airline that flew around Texas. And they, how were they going to compete with the, well, they had the TWAs of the world, and Pan Am, and Eastern, and uh, Continental. Remember those airlines? They are no more, right? They loved the fly and it showed. Adopted positively outrageous service. In fact, they used to be on some of the gates. Positively outrageous service, the Southwest way. Mm -hmm. yeah. They adopted the culture that it takes to, to create positively outrageous service. We're going to go through seven elements mm -hmm. that, that are necessary in order to do this. So the first is you've got to hire the right people. We call them service naturals. It's the people who put service in front of self. The se Once you've got those people, then yep. leave. So, and, and by the way, let me just back up a little bit. I apologize, I had a little challenge with the, the slides. What we have discovered is that in, in creating a positively outrageous service culture, there are seven habits. So there are principles to do on purpose. We want everybody to know the language. But in order to create a culture, you have to have things in place that we do habitually. Uh, and we'll talk about for reasons why. So the first one is making sure you have the right, make sure you have the right people. Are you hiring the right people for the right positions? And then it's in energizing the leadership. There's an old saying that says the fish stinks from the head. <laughs> that may be you. So, you know, we have to really understand that all, is our leadership actually flying in the same direction? Yeah. They ignite the revolution of positively outrageous service. Once they've ignited, in especially in a larger organization, you've got to equip the, the departments, the different managers. So like with an airline, 
positively outrageous service is going to look different in reservations than it does in baggage handling or on the airplane or in our hospital. It's going to look different in admitting as it does in radiology. Mm -hmm. So you've, there's got to be consistency, but it, how it's interpreted will be different in different departments. You've got to equip and coach the management teams, the department heads, to deliver positive outrageous service and what that would look like in their specific areas. Yeah. By the way, this is a classic where most people drop the ball because we have great vision and the people want it, but it's that the people that make it happen are men and management. Really, yeah, that's really we have a bottleneck. Hold on, and then you've got to engage your people. I want to be part of what's going on versus a victim of what's going on. So what can we do to teach them the language, to teach them what's expected, and to help them own their role? Because I can't be everywhere, so we all have to own our piece. So what are we doing to give them that vision and give them the tools necessary to be POS to the people that are in front of them? And it's incredible when you get the front line engaged, the creativity that comes from them is astounding. Now there's a saying uh, that you can't improve that which you don't measure. So you need to evaluate. And the beauty of uh, positively outrageous service, remember what is the, one is, what's one of the key attributes that comes out of positively outrageous? You create what? Compelling? Compelling word of mouth, positive word of mouth. Thanks for the rescue on that. Thank you. <laughs> and there is a one question. You know, we've all taken those surveys, but you've probably seen this one question being asked because this is the key to if you're, if you're delivering positively outrageous service. You've seen this question. On a scale of 10 to 0, 10 being highly likely, 0 being unlikely, how likely are you to recommend Frostbank, a yoga studio, a workout studio, a, a credit union? How likely are you to recommend that particular entity to a friend or colleague? You've seen that question, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Now, if it's a 9 or a 10, guess what? They, you've delivered positively outrageous service because they are what they call uh, a, a strong advocate. You know, they are they're advocates. They are strong promoters. If it's an 8, 7, or 6, they're passive. They only will respond if, oh, do you know a good bank in this area? And then 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, they're detractors. So you can measure positively outrageous service through what's called the NPS score, the Net Promoter So score. many great programs yeah. to help us actually get our hands around what's our service like. Um, you know, we can measure sales, we can measure bottom line profits, but can we measure the experience? The answer is absolutely. Yeah. But you know, once we measure, then we gotta find where the holes are, and we gotta, we gotta get better. So it's enhancing what, where we're at right now. And, and the biggest issue is, uh, you might ask yourself, is in our departments, you know, we have, uh, everybody does a great job except for, I can come to your hospital and have a wonderful experience at the hospital and the people were great, the, the nurses were fantastic, my doctor actually had a great bedside manner, but the, the exit process was horrific or the bills were off and things like that and it just changes the entire experience. So everybody has to roll a play or, or play a role. So we have to enhance where, where, we, where are the holes and where do we mine the gaps. And then the last one is, is to celebrate. You know, when you exalt what your, your people, it's to find out who are the, the POS heroes. Find the stories and share those. And when you, when you celebrate, uh, extraordinary things happen because actually the bar gets raised. People want to go, yeah, I want, I want, I want that. And of course, they're going to have to do a little bit better than the last person who got it. <laughs> so celebrating uh, enhances everything and, and, and so forth. So these are the seven habits. And uh, like Michael said, they have to be habitual. That's what a habit is, mm -hmm. right? And every one of them, if you take any one of those out, you lose it. And of course, Southwest did this incredibly well. But there's, uh, what, would, what, would, what would your company look like? What would uh, Texas Health Resources, how about Positively Outrageous Service, THR way? Mm -hmm. Or Positively Outrageous, the Frost way? Hmm. Or Positively Outrageous Service, the US Concrete way? Yeah, yeah the fact that they, they, they're probably saying this already. The question we want to ask you today and really kind of take the time to challenge you today is, are they saying it on purpose? Are they lucky they just happen to get you on the phone? Are they walking away from your organization uh, just grateful that they had a, it's not necessarily consistent, but I'm glad it happened this time? I mean, we are not the victims of our customer experience. We, we are the creators of our customer experience, and we have to do it more on purpose. There are three principles we want you to take away today. I want you to play more today. Go back to your offices asking, how are we playing today? I want you to actually be more unexpected than ever before. Be random. You know, have those people go, I don't know what you were smoking over at the HEB, you know, things today, but I don't know what they do at that chamber, but, but, but I, I want some. And you watch how infectious you're going to be. And we have a gift for you. Yes. So hopefully you dropped your business card in. We're going to be giving away uh, the Positive Outrageous Service uh, book today. We have a few are, are on sale. 
but if you've put your business card in, we want everybody to be a winner. Mm -hmm. So everybody who's given us uh, your business card, uh, we were going to send you, actually, because we only had a little bit of time to share about the seven habits, but we're going to send you an eight, eight podcast series on the seven habits of positively outrageous service. Mm -hmm. And or the alternative way you can get that is to text 6686. Uh, if you've got a phone, you want to go this way, uh, uh, text the word own it, all caps, no spaces. Type the word own it to 6686. You're going to get a request for your uh, email address, and then we will send you directly to your email the eight podcasts yeah. as a thank you just for coming by. We got a chance to expose you to some of this stuff, but we'd like you to hear just a little bit of, of drill down. Yeah, and we'll put it up at the end there in the last slide. Mm -hmm. And finally, wow. Okay, who doesn't want a wow experience? Mm -hmm. And uh, so take away these three principles. Think about those seven habits. You, only, you take one of those habits out. If you don't hire the right people, you can't, you can't ignite them. You can't engage them. If you're not engaged them, if you're not measuring, you can't improve that which you don't measure. And if you're not celebrating, you're not elevating. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be with you today. Yep. Thanks for letting us go for so long. And I will tell you this. Um, I, I will tell you this. Uh, anything we can do to help. We're both actually local. We live in the area, yep. uh, which is really nice, actually. So it's, it's wonderful just to kind of see the businesses. And, and, and this particular chamber is actually quite known, as you know that. So you guys do a great job. And it was our first time to get, to, to get a chance to play with you. So thank you for having us today. And if there's anything we can do to help, please don't hesitate to call. Uh, we, love, we love working with our family. So uh, uh, thanks again. And, and we just want to help you become positively outrageous. outrageous. Thanks a lot, guys.